New Life Church. Well, we are looking this morning at 1 Corinthians again. Normally we are going through the book of Acts. We've been doing that verse by verse, expositionally, over the last few months. But today we are going to spend some time looking at what the Lord says about the Lord's table. So today we will partake in the Lord's table. You may have seen the elements outside on your way in. And I'll explain to you how we are going to be doing that. But I wanted to spend some time looking at what the Bible teaches about this. Last month, when we had communion, I preached from the same passage. And I preached two uh, points. And today I just want to finish off the other two points. So today I just have another two points um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there with me as we look at this passage. So the author of this book is the Apostle Paul, and he is writing to the, the church at Corinth. Um, we know the Apostle Paul established the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper in the church at Corinth when he planted that church, and although he did not personally baptize many of the Christians in the Corinthian church, he affirmed baptism as a, as a non-negotiable act of obedience to the Lord for all believers. But at the same time, he also affirmed the Lord's Supper as a non-negotiable act of obedience to the Lord for all believers. So there are two sacraments that we see in the Old Testament of the Bible, and there are two sacraments in the New Testament of the Bible. Now, we use the word sacrament. What it means is ritual, or it means a ceremony. So two ceremonies that we see in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, which are part and parcel of the same. Um, in the Old Testament, we see circumcision um, and the, the Passover meal. And the sacrament of circumcision signified entry into the covenant community of God's people. And the sacrament of the Passover meal signified fellowship or communion within the covenant community of God's people. Well, the two Old Testament sacraments, which I've just mentioned, have been replaced by the New Testament sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. So the sacrament of circumcision was replaced by the sacrament of baptism, which also signifies the same thing, entrance into the covenant community of God's people. And the sacrament of the, the Passover meal was replaced by the, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, which also signifies fellowship or communion within the covenant community of God's family. So last month we looked at two points. We looked at two points from this passage, from verse 25 to verse 26. We saw the need to come to the Lord's Supper often and together. The need to come to the Lord's Supper often and together. And then we saw from verse 17 to verse 22, the need to come to the Lord's Supper with, with love for others. With love for others. So we're going to look at the next two today. But let me just read first the passage and then we will study God's Word from verse 17, if you would follow me, to verse 34. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you came together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. So when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord 
unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you who are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Well, let's pray first and ask for God's blessings. Lord, we do thank you for your word, which does instruct us. And help us to live godly lives. Thank you for these instructions right here that the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. To help us partake, but also to worship you properly in this ordinance, in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Lord, we have gathered together today to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, Lord, you would help us to do that pray, Lord, that you would help us to examine our hearts just as we read, so that we will not be sinning against you in any way. If there are sins in our hearts right now that we are entertaining, that we are not repenting of, we pray, Lord, that you would reveal those sins to us now, so that we may get right with you, so that we may worship you, Lord, and we may enjoy you today. So, Father, we ask, please, teach us more about your, your character, help us to love you more, and help us to be more obedient and honor you in our responses. So Father, we ask for your blessings as we study this word. I ask for your help to teach this. May your spirit be our teacher today and not allow any of these words to fall on the ground. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning I'm going to ask the husbands a question. I'm going to put the husbands on the spot this morning, okay? Why do you can thank you later? Um, but please, husbands, turn to your wives and, and look at them in their eyes, okay? And answer the following question. You have, you have literally two seconds to answer this question, okay? Two seconds. What is the day of your wedding anniversary? Okay, I see some husbands and wives very happy. Um, I see some others a little bit um, shocked at the answers. Well, I ask you to ask this question to demonstrate how important it is to remember your wedding anniversary, isn't it? Now, suppose on that day, on your wedding anniversary, husbands, you, you woke up and you told your wife, Yes, honey, I remember today is our anniversary. I acknowledge that today is the day we got married. And then you proceed to watch television and do your own thing without doing anything else. I see some wives looking at their husbands as well. <laughs> how would your wife respond to that? Well, she wouldn't say, Well, how thoughtful, honey. I'm glad that you didn't forget. Um, you don't remember your anniversary by just stating the facts, do you? Um, she would rightly expect you to to have a layer of activity in your remembrance, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure she would expect you maybe to write a card or to um, make, make breakfast. May I'm giving too many hints here. <laughs> maybe take her on a date, maybe make coffee, whatever you do. Do the washing. Um, do the washing. <laughs> there would be something involved, wouldn't there, to involve a layer of activity. Well, we remember in our marriage, our covenant promise that we have made with our husbands and, and our, our wives on that day. And we cherish each other and we love our spouses afresh. And we remember that day when we got married. And we should come to the Lord's Supper really in the same way. You know, when the Lord's Supper is served, the believers experience an, an affection. We experience an affectionate remembrance because the gospel is remembered, the gospel is recalled, and the gospel is then again reapplied. And we remember the grace that was purchased at Christ's death as the same 
grace that we need when we, when we come to the table. So my first point this morning is from verse 23 to verse 26. We need to come to the Lord's Supper with remembrance of the Lord. We need to come to the Lord's table with remembrance of the Lord. Look at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the first thing we see there in these verses is that we need to remember the Lord. We need to remember the Lord himself. And maybe you're thinking, well, well wait a minute, Pastor. I'm a, I'm a Christian. How could I possibly forget the Lord? How is that possible? But the, the reality is different. You know, as we get busy with all sorts of things in our lives, even when we serve the Lord, we can easily forget the Lord Himself. You know, it's been 14 months since my mom passed away. And there are times when I find myself forgetting what she looked like. And at those times, I, I quickly take out a photograph to remind myself of all the, the details and all of the features that I may have forgotten. And in the Lord's Supper, we do exactly the same. Jesus left us a picture of Himself for us to remember Him by, to remember all the details, to remember all the features of the Gospel. And we should pause, and we should look at this picture carefully and honestly and often. And when we do it, we should remind us ourselves of His great love for us, has shown supremely on the cross when He died. It should fill our hearts with a desire to, to want to see Him when He comes again. It should make our, our hearts joyful looking to that great expectation. Is there anything in my life that needs to be dealt with before I meet my bridegroom face to face? These are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. It should touch our hearts. It should should make us say, thank God for what He has given to us in Christ Jesus. So the Lord's Supper is indeed a, it's a time to remember. A time to focus on the details, to remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's also a time for us to remember the Lord's substitutionary sacrifice. We are to remember what the Lord accomplished and what He actually did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus took the bread, it tells us in verse 24, He broke it, He gave thanks, and He said in verse 24, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This was a fulfillment of a prophecy that was made in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 53, that Jesus, Jesus the spotless Lamb of God, would die for our sins. Our guilt was placed upon Jesus. We should realize when we come to the Lord's Supper that Jesus didn't die for Himself. Jesus died in our place. And that's what we mean by substitutionary sacrifice. Jesus didn't die for Himself. He substituted His place for us. He died in our place. He bore all the guilt that we should have. And now by faith in Christ, we can be freed from these sins and live a guilt-free life. Jesus said, this is my body. This is my body. I understand that to mean that Jesus was speaking symbolically. And the elements that we hold and the elements that we, that we partake of, they are pictures of Jesus' body. They are pictures of Jesus' blood, which was shed for us. The bread to remind us of the body that was broken for us. Is He spiritually present with us when we celebrate the Lord's Supper? I think so, but not in a, in a mystical sense any more than He is spiritually present when we, when we worship together or when we hear God's Word preached together. Partaking of the elements does not 
auto, automatically confer grace on anyone. Unless we partake in faith. Unless we are partaking with a heart that is right with the Lord. So when you come to the Lord's Supper by faith, remember Jesus' suffering and the death on the cross for you. Peter says in his letter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he puts it this way, He himself bore our sins on his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. We need to remember that. We need to never forget that. And then we are to remember the complete forgiveness that we have through the new covenant. We need to remember the forgiveness that we have through the new covenant. The old covenant that happened in the Old Testament, the old sacrifices, could not permanently take away sins. We know that from Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews tells us that. But Jesus says here in verse 25, He says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. He talks about this new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This new covenant really is a reference to a promise that was made in the Old Testament. And that promise is from the prophet Jeremiah. He said in chapter 31 verse 34, he prophesied, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This is the new covenant. And the Lord has fulfilled His promise. And we should never forget that the Lord never forgets. That the Lord keeps His promises. Of course, the Lord, He is omniscient. So He doesn't forget our, our sins as, as we forget things. But rather what He means here, that He will not bring up our, our sins at the judgment seat. Those sins have been forgiven. They have been cast as far as the east is from the west. And in faith, as we come and approach the Lord's table, as we remember His sacrifice for us and the forgiveness of our sins, we remember the trust that we put in Jesus, that He is indeed our greatest need, that our faith needs to be in the very sacrifice of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And if you have done that, never forget that you have been reconciled to God. That you have been reconciled to God forever. And as we read in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Our sins have been forgiven. And then fourthly, we need to remember that Jesus is coming again. We need to remember that Jesus is coming again. I heard a story this week of a pastor who was speaking to a men's group. And he asked the men there, he said, If you knew that Jesus was returning tomorrow, and this was the last day of your life, what would you do differently? And one man said, Well, I would spend all of my money as fast as I could because I knew I couldn't take it with me. <laughs> Another man said, Well, I would tell everyone I knew that Jesus was coming so some might believe in Him. And then the third man said, Well, I would move in with my mother-in-law. <laughs> and the rest of the group looked at him strangely and asked him, Why would you move in with your mother-in-law? And then he explained, Well, living with her would make it the longest day of my life. <laughs> I have a wonderful mother-in-law, so I'm not saying anything about that. <laughs> the point I'm making is we need to remember, isn't it? First Corinthians, look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. We need to remember that the Lord is returning. And the Greek verb there, proclaim, is used in many other places in the gospel, talking about proclamation, the proclamation of the gospel. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's a proclamation of the very death and the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we couldn't proclaim that. Think about this for a moment. We couldn't proclaim that 
unless the Lord had raised from the dead, isn't it? I mean, He's not coming back unless He's alive, isn't it? And each time we partake of the Lord's Supper, it could really be the last time that we do this. The Lord could appear next week, tomorrow. He could appear in the next couple of hours. The trumpet may sound, and the dead in Christ will, will rise, and we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians tells us about that. So the Lord's Supper should remind us to be ready for that day. We need to be ready for that day. But Paul goes on to give us a, a sober reminder, a sober warning in my last point. Point number four. Come to the Lord's Supper with the examination of yourself. Come to the Lord's Supper with an examination of yourself. We see that in verse 27 to verse 34. So, so far we've seen we need to come often. We need to come together. We've seen we need to come with love for others. We've seen we need to come with remembrance of the Lord. And here we see we need to come with examination of ourselves. We need to come with examination of ourselves. And really, what's happening here in summary, Paul says that Many of the Corinthians were, were suffering. Many of them were suffering from weakness. Many of them were suffering from sickness. And there were even some of the Corinthians who were dying. Who were dying because they were coming to the Lord's Supper in a wrong way. They were coming to the Lord's so Supper in a, in a non-loving way. They were coming to the Lord's Supper in a, in a disrespectful way. They were coming to the Lord's Supper in a self-centered way. That he has described in this passage. He clarifies in, in verse 32 that this judgment doesn't mean eternal condemnation. But rather discipline. The Lord disciplines his children. He doesn't allow them to continue in their sins. Really Paul is saying to avoid this discipline. To avoid such discipline. He gives us the requirements for coming to the Lord's Supper. Look at verse 28. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread, the bread and to drink of the cup. So we are to examine ourselves. And Paul means that we should do a private mental inspection of our relationship with Christ. A private mental inspection of our relationship with Christ. The Lord's not asking you to examine your, your husband. He's not asking you to examine your wife. He's not asking you to examine the person next to you. The scriptures are telling us to examine ourselves. And the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. Am I truly trusting in Him alone for salvation? Am I sinfully at odds with somebody else this morning? Is there any sin that I have not confessed and I have not turned from this morning. So I'm not saying that we have to be perfect. The Lord's Supper is not for the perfect. The Lord's Supper is not for the sinners, but for those who are dealing with their sin on the heart level as they are walking with Christ. I remember as a young Christian, when the Lord's Supper came a couple of times, I thought it was very, very holy and um, very pious to reject the Lord's Supper because of some unconfessed sin in my life. And I thought I was doing a, a wonderful thing. But I was rejecting the Lord's Supper. That's the point. I wasn't willing to deal with my sin. I wasn't willing to confess my sin. I wasn't willing to call out to the Lord for repentance. I would rather reject the Lord's Supper. That's, that's not what this passage is about. That's not what Paul is telling us to do. He's telling us to deal with our sins. To deal with the sin on a heart level as we walk with Christ. As we are reminded of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we are reminded of what He has done for us on the cross. As we are reminded of the sins that He paid for on our behalf. It's encouraging to remember that at the first Lord's Supper, Remember with all the disciples gathered there? What were the disciples doing? The disciples were arguing. <laughs> what were they arguing about? 
about who was the greatest, who would sit at the, the right side of the Lord. Jesus predicted Peter's threefold denial of him that very night. And a short time later, the disciples couldn't stay awake to watch and pray with Jesus in the garden. So the Lord's Supper is not for perfect saints, but rather for those who struggle with their shortcomings, they struggle with their, their sins, they want to overcome them, they hate their sins. This struggle should be common with all of us. But we should not shrug off any known sin or use this Lord's table as an excuse by just saying, well, it's just a weakness of mine, it's just a propensity that I have, it's part of my DNA, I do these sins because that's what I do. That's not what we should be doing. Paul asks a question in, in Romans chapter 6. He says, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he answers that. May it never be. God forbid, he says. How shall we who, who die to our sin still live in our sin? The Lord's Supper gives us a repeated reminder that we need to deal with our sins on the heart level. An honest mental inspection before God. If we sin against the risen Savior, if we presume against His word, what else do we have? Listen to the Apostle's warning in verse 29. In verse 29 he says, Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why, verse 30, Many of you are weak, many of you are ill, and some have died. I'm sure you would agree, those are, those are sobering words to be hearing this morning. But I think, sadly, many churches and amongst many Christians, this attitude is frequently demonstrated by our, our lack of belief in these words. By a lack of belief concerning these warnings that we receive from the Lord. Do you believe God has spoken these words to us? Do you believe that God has spoken these truths? Knowing His warning, will you change? Will you repent of your sins and get right with your brothers and sisters? Get right with your spouse? Have you examined yourself this morning? Let me just add, you know, these instructions and and warnings are not meant to rob us of joy. These instructions are to do exactly the opposite. These instructions and warnings are given to ensure our joy. Are there to ensure our joy. When we know that, that we are right with the Lord. When we know we are in a right standing before God and before each other. We can partake. Joyfully, we can partake freely. Our motives are right and we re are revering the Lord and we are honoring the Lord. And there is a freedom that we have to approach the Lord's table without guilt, without regret. And that's why we have these instructions this morning. So that we can approach the Lord's table with freedom. With freedom. So as we prepare this morning to take communion... I want you to know that this is for all who are born again. This table is for all who, through faith, believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection has reconciled them to God. Somebody asked me once, at what point do we allow our children to partake of the Lord's table? Well, in our home, I told our children if they've professed their faith in Christ, they need to get baptized. That's a public proclamation of their faith. I've told them that they need to publicly declare their faith to others in the act of baptism. And once they've done that, they can partake of the, the Lord's table. These are the two ordinances that we've been given in the Bible, isn't it? So consider this for this morning. If you have been partaking of the Lord's table and you've never been baptized then reconsider what you are doing this morning. If you are not willing to get baptized publicly, 
maybe there's still areas that you need to deal with in your own salvation. If you are willing to get baptized, come and speak to me. If you've never been baptized, and you realize that this is something that you need to do, to enjoy the Lord's table freely, without regret or without remorse, then please come and speak to me. We can, we can work that out. But by doing this, we are saying, this morning, by partaking together in the Lord's table, we are saying that Jesus did die for our sin. And that He did die in order to redeem us. And that He did die to justify us before God. We are declaring that to everyone this morning. And each one of us is saying that His blood was shed for our sins. And even though we were undeserving sinners, we are declaring that He has paid the price for our sins. So the Lord's Supper reminds us to keep the cross of Jesus Christ central. Keep the cross of Jesus Christ central. And we are to come often with love for others. And we are to come with the remembrance of the Lord. And we are to come examining ourselves as we do this morning. So let me pray and then I will give some instructions of how we will partake together so that we can be enjoying the Lord together as a body this morning. Father, we do thank you for your word, which is a, a lamp unto our feet and a, a light unto our path. We thank you for your word this morning that has shown us how we are to partake of the Lord's Supper. We thank you, Lord, that we can come often and we can come together to remember this wonderful gospel that has saved us from our sins. Thank you that we can come with love for others. You know, Lord, this is a corporate declaration this morning. As we, together, unified, declare that we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who has taken our sins. Lord, we come with remembrance as well. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to examine ourselves today as we hold these elements in our hands. And again, Lord, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for the cross. And we pray that you would speak to us, that you would help us to be honest with you, and help us to be honest with ourselves as we partake together this morning. For your glory, Lord, we want to worship you. We want to draw near to you today. We ask in Jesus' name.